Good afternoon and welcome to the second of our webinars for this uh, series of support that we are doing in partnership, that Visa Scotland is doing in partnership with Digital Boost. Uh, I am expecting uh, extraordinarily good content from our host, Brian Tate from Alium. Uh, but before I get Brian to start, just a couple of, of things uh, for your information. First of all, we would really love you to be asking questions as you go along through the through the session. The control panel on your right allows you to do that. So just put your questions in. We've got a Q&A session at, at the end, about, so we'll come off roughly around quarter two to be able to have that um, chat with you. Uh, hopefully we'll cover off all your questions and we we'll maybe even try and answer those as we go along through the session. Um, the presentation will be shared. We'll, we'll publish that on visitscotland.org. It'll take about 10 days or so because we like to add text to a sub, subtitles to it so people can read it as well. Um, we, we're really keen that you give us some feedback on, on the session. We'll give you a code at the end of the webinar uh, for you to input uh, onto the website and we will really, really appreciate you, you, uh, you sending uh, that to us. And finally, just a little bit of an outline. Uh, we, working with Vis Visit, uh, Visit Scotland, uh, working with Digital Boost, delivers several methods of help and support to you as a business, which you can tap into. The, there is a regular new Digital Boost podcast, uh, free local webinars, which this, this is a national one. There are also local ones happening. So please do check the Business Gateway and Digital Boost website. And there are some brilliant online uh, resources that we will often signpost to. So some some really good support. So Brian, look forward to hearing the full amount of your presentation. Excellent. Over Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that. <clears throat> um, hi everyone. Hope you're all hope you're all well. So we're going to chat about user experience today. Um, I hope you find it useful. We've got quite a lot to cover in a a short space of time, but we've we've tried to produce it in a way that you've got real things you can take away. Um, and do with uh, and actually implement yourself afterwards. So while it might be a new topic to some people, it doesn't have to be an overly complicated topic. So we've got a couple of sections we're going to run through. The, the first one is just a, just a couple of slides just to talk about some of the stats from the industry. And, and you'll probably know some of them yourself being in the industry. I am a mere tech who delivers training, but um, you'll, you'll know some of them will run through some of them. But the second section is probably the, the meaty part. Um, so we'll chat a, a little bit about what user experience is and why it's important and then try to give you some live examples about just looking at credibility and site speeds and flow of content these sort of things and then in the last section we'll talk a little bit about measuring it we know the measuring part is the part that quite often people are intimidated by you know you hear things like google analytics a b testing heat mapping and these are the sort of things that people don't want to do because it sounds scary but actually it works and it's a huge huge part of it and um, so we'll chat a little bit about that and hopefully give you a bit of a start. So that's what we're going to cover today. And um, we've got about 45 minutes, 40 minutes to, to chat through it all. I'm going to try and give you some live examples. I'll put a caveat in for my own benefit. And um, the, the volume of tabs I have open in the background already has been spotted. So things might go wrong with it. I'll try my best. Bear bear with me, but it's good to show you live rather than just show you slides all the time. Um, okay, so just looking at some of the industry stats. Listen, you, you can Google these things and you're in the industry, you, you'll know what a lot of these stats are. You, you'll recognize some of them or you'll have your own. Um, just, just from my own input, I, I've given you the link down the bottom to this. It's a report that Google carried out. Um, really, really insightful, actually, uh, pointing at a lot of things that, you know, price isn't the most important thing. We know price is important to us because we want people to book. But actually, customers have a lot of questions. They've got a lot of things that they want to know. It can vary by trip, what it is that they're looking for, value is seen as sometimes more important than the actual price of so something costing 50 pounds with no description versus something costing 50 pounds with loads of detail about what's included. One of them just looks more valuable straight away, doesn't it? Um, so flip over and have a, a look at that when you get the this, this slides. This is a, an example of it. Just now and scroll down, you can see that the fact, I mean, it's like a good solid survey, 7,000 odd people ask these questions. It gives you some some insights to what, what people were thinking, but, but probably, one of the important parts is when you scroll down here that research reveals that um, not meeting people's needs uh, as a, a big deterrent to booking more, more so than price. So when we're talking about users' needs, quite often that can fairly easily be answered just by giving information away on a website and answering 
questions and making it clear and make, making it easy to use. So don't focus too much on the price. It doesn't always have to be about getting the booking right now. It's trying to satisfy those needs and answering questions that, that people have and giving them some confidence. Um, there's also a PDF on the Visit Scotland website itself. I, I've given you the link again at the bottom, so you can get a copy of that when you download the slides. It's quite interesting as well. I found that it talks about segments in the industry, and while it might not go into great detail about what you should do with a website based on this, it is quite interesting. So it has the range of, I guess, feelings that people have. So people who are post-pandemic going to be absolutely fine, no worries at all. They're out there and they're booking a two-week holiday because they, they're perfectly confident. To the other end of the scale where people kind of want to go, but they're a little bit scared, they're, a, they're just a little bit intimidated and they need um, they need answers that they're going to go and research, they're going to go and Google, they're going to be on lots of websites looking for things. And again, it kind of comes back to the content and I guess how usable your website is. Are you giving them the information to improve their confidence when they're looking at the website? I think when you look at search engines, we'll, we'll probably mention search engines a few times through this, but people do Google, some people Bing. People do Google though, and you'll know yourself when you search for something. If you don't find what you've answered, uh, what you've looked for, you hit the back button on the browser, don't you? And you go back to the search results and go somewhere else. But ultimately, you will find your answer. It might take you three, four, five websites, but but you will get there. So that's what your users will be doing as well. So it's the sort of choice of whether you give them the information that they might be looking for or don't, and whether they then end up speaking to you or speaking to what is potentially a, a competitor of yours. Okay, so that, that just some just some things to get get you thinking. I'm sure you'll have <clears throat> more content like that for yourself. You're you're in the industry, so you'll know more of it. But just just to give you an idea of why usability and user experience is important, that is where a lot of people's heads at just now. Okay, so in terms of, of your actual website um, and actually doing something with it, so so what is um, user experience? I just need to move my window a wee bit over here. Uh, the joys of doing it live. So, your tourism website, what, what is user experience? So, I've given you a few quotes here that you can read um, when you get a copy of the slides. Ultimately, though, it's, it is about the overall experience the user has when they're browsing the website, which I know is just the same words the other way around. But it's a, it's a movement on from just looking good. Um, so, websites went through a phase where as long as it was big and shiny, it was good. Um, now, it's not. It can still look really good, obviously, but it has to work well. Um, which means things like uh, paragraphs have to be clear. Uh, it means that headlines have to be clear. It means that it has to load fast. It means that calls to actions have to stand out. It means that the flow of the page has to be fairly simple to let me go through. It means that the booking process has to be fairly simple and not asking me a hundred questions. And um, so that that's a sort of view. This one in the bottom left um, is just taken straight from Wikipedia. The user experience is how a user interacts with an experience, a product, system, or service. It includes a person's perceptions of utility, ease of use, and efficiency. Um, I always think it's a, a good thing to do to compare user experience to the offline world. I think that makes it easier to understand because I think you gradually learn there are things that you do in an online world with your website and your social that you just wouldn't do in an offline world. So you picture the bricks and mortar shop. If people couldn't come in, or people weren't coming in, you would update the window display or you know these sort of things. But yet on a website, people will complain that no one visits and not actually do something about it. And I think you as well, you, you're in businesses where you're interacting with people all the time. So over the years, you will have collected feedback, whether it be TripAdvisor, um, whether it's actual customers speaking to you before they go to TripAdvisor. You'll have collected feedback about quality of the service, how they found that, whether the room was clean, and um, whether the tour was good, whether the tour operator was maybe not having their best day, do you know, all, all of these things. And you will have done something to address that. In the physical world, you will have done something to address that over the years. So online user experience is really just about trying to find out what the same challenges are online and trying to address them. Um, so some examples of the offline world, just to show you, some of these are maybe a bit extreme and you've got to have a bottle of ketchup in a presentation or it's not a real presentation. Um, so this one up at the top right, if this path, you see this in your local parks all the time, if this path had been designed with user experience in mind, um, the path would have been where the dirt is to get from A to B faster. It wouldn't be going that way. You could probably go so extreme that if it was built for user experience, the whole thing would be concrete so we could walk anywhere we want. Um, but it's got the balance. Um, ketchup, we know we know that the ingredients have changed just for health, sugar, salt, these sort of things, but ultimately it's the same product. 
but it's a different shaped bottle and the bottle changes the experience. So no longer are you having to shake the ketchup bottle for it all to glug out on your plate and then the top of it be absolutely messy that you can't open it the next thing. It's now a squeezy bottle that sits upside down and it just makes the experience nicer. So same idea that we're trying to approach when it comes to websites, trying to find the things that might put people off, um, what might stop them coming back, what might encourage them to engage. And a lot of this stuff, one article I was reading, I'll put a link to it later on, it actually quite, I think quite boldly and probably quite rightly says, a lot of user experience is just common sense, fix things that aren't working. Um, so, so that's what we'll chat about. Why is it important? Well, a number of reasons. I think the loyalty and the customer satisfaction are two sort of obvious ones, aren't they? You want people to enjoy the experience on the website, whether it's finding information, browsing around or booking, so that they'll come back again. That that would be a, a, a huge goal. I think the conversion rates as well. You want people to be getting in touch and asking you questions. And if you're giving them the information, hopefully they'll do that. So less information on a hard to use website is going to cause me to leave. Good information on an easy to use website is probably going to encourage me to at least inquire or at least bookmark your website for consideration later on. So important for a lot of reasons. We'll also chat a, a little bit about SEO just towards the end of this because their SEO and usability go hand in hand quite well together. So fixing uh, things for usability, it's going to help your organic search. And if you're fixing things for organic search, it's going to help your usability as well. So there's a, there's a, a ranking in Google element that makes usability important too. Okay, so hopefully this is all making sense and I'm not just a, a waffling mess trying to explain this but hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what usability is what user experience is and, and kind of why you should be why you should be thinking about it we have said a lot of it's fairly common sense so we'll, we'll run through a few things now we'll look at, at credibility a, a little bit of trust a little bit of calls to action some of the content on your page and just just some other bits we've got some some good examples to, to show you here one of the examples just incidentally we've used because we think generally the site looks quite good and works quite well but we've ran it through a broken link checker tool um, and I think it's got over a hundred broken links on it as well, you know. So that's it's little things like that that you could use some tools for and find and, and fixing that improves the customer's experience. So credibility, that's one of the things that we'll tell people when we're running these sort of webinars or providing insight into into usability. Be credible, be be trustworthy. We we assume that you're not not trustworthy. We are trustworthy. We assume that you are good people, good companies, good organisations offering a good service. We we assume that to some degree. Um, but make it crystal clear. Don't don't make me assume. Don't let me assume. Show me and show me clearly where you can. So we're talking about things on here like the the good to go logo that's around for all the websites that we've looked at as part of pulling together live examples for this. It's quite worrying how many websites don't have that on it, and it's a, it's an easy easy thing to set up. So the big good to go logo on here, and um, your tour board rating for business visit Scotland, but also things like your TripAdvisor reviews, certifications, whether you've been mentioned in the press, testimonials that you might have. I would actually go as far as to say, well, things like the address, your address and phone number, um, have them on the footer, make it easy for me to contact you, don't look like you're hiding, down to things like privacy policies, terms and conditions, registration numbers if you're a limited company, VAT numbers if you have them, all these things that, you know what, I might not actually go and read them word for word, but they're there and I saw them and it's ticking a box in my head while I'm browsing your website. And the easy way to check the impact of that is just to watch the next time you're browsing around uh, a handful of websites. You might not necessarily, it's a weird thing to say, you might not necessarily notice that those things are there, but you will notice when they're not there and you can't find them. You will notice when they don't stand out. So just make sure they're there. So we've got some examples on the screen, just um, award-winning and um, some of the logos that you have up the top we can go live we can try and go live and uh, see how this works let me just close some tabs down um, and we've got a handful of, of websites here I've, I've selected a few so we don't get too confused with all of them but you can see here and um, custom re reviews in the middle taken from multiple different channels some key information up here pet friendly wi-fi and um, you come through to websites like this one I don't know if you scroll down the bottom of this one, there's Platinum Service Awards, ABTA members, payment details on here, reviews again. I, I like, I love this website in particular. Um, not that I like any one of them more than the other, but I like this one in particular because when you click into the About Us section, my goodness, look at all of this. 
visas, passports, privacy policies, peace of mind, no change fees, COVID, I mean, oh, that's just good. This is a company that's really, really thought about it, hasn't it? So yeah, make, make sure you're thinking about the credible stuff on your website. So reviews, badges, accreditations, contact details, secure certificates, make sure it's HTTPS, registration numbers, if you have them, all this good stuff. We often refer to, to clients as, it's the stuff that most people will say, I'll get that later. Don't get it later, get it now, okay? Uh, reviews in particular, they definitely work. Uh, there, there's no question that they work. We know that people might not actually click through and read every single review, but they do look for reviews. I look for reviews. We've just booked a couple of things to go away with the kids and we're looking at reviews. And incidentally, I've taken a place that we're looking at staying and looked up the TripAdvisor, Booking.com and website reviews for the place just to get a, an across the board sort of view of what other people think of it. But do have them on there. So whether it's a mixture of, of you hand posting them on there or whether it's pulled in from a, a TripAdvisor, whether it's pulling in your Facebook or, or your Google reviews, these sort of things, just, just make sure you're putting them on there. Think of video testimonials as well, case studies, these sort of things, try and get them on. Um, lots of places that you can get reviews. Probably one thing I would say about reviews, uh, you're in an industry where people will review you on multiple different platforms, social media, Facebook, these sort of things, So, which is fine. But maybe put some thought into where you would prefer the review to be happening. What's the most important place and the second most important place to get the reviews? And maybe when you're asking for reviews, try and push people in that direction rather than leaving me to review you where I want to review you because I might use some obscure review website and you end up with 10 channels with one review each rather than one channel with 10 reviews on it. So just, just something like that. Um, just in terms of reputation as well, um, there's a webinar coming up just about managing your reputation online. So worth, worth registering for that as well. You go into a little bit more detail about the sort of things you can do, which which will answer a lot of stuff to do with credibility on the on the website. So nothing overly complicated so far, but something for you to, to definitely go and look at. Um, and again, we've just got some screenshots up here of reviews. We'll, we'll show you some of these live as we go. Um, so hopefully, hopefully that makes sense. So that that's credibility. Just just appear trustworthy. Don't don't leave it to me to assume you're trustworthy. I assume you are. But uh, you know, if I'm going to hand over card details, I want to know that you are. Um, so so just make that easy and make that stuff crystal clear. Um, moving on to, to making it easy for me to book and buy or inquire. It doesn't don't have to be booking online. I might just want to contact you and ask you a question. Make it easy. It's amazing the amount of websites you look at that don't make it easy. And I think part of the problem is, in our experience, is that it's not that they've deliberately made it bad. It's that they've put it live and thought, I'll, I'll come back and I'll address that and make it easier at some point. And then you get busy and you don't come back and make it easier. Come back and make it easier or just make it easier in the first place. So. There's some research out there that shows you that calls to action generally work better nearer the top, often over to the top right of a page. And so, so maybe start by by doing that. So this example here, I mean, this is a bright green that's not used anywhere else on the site. So so it stands out. Uh, it stands out quite well. And um, you can see some other examples at the Balmoral. I quite like this one over on the top right hand side. There's, there's nothing else apart from the logo that's red. So this this definitely stands out, doesn't it? I think that's a, a fairly quick, a fairly easy one to stand out. This one, mm, so I'm not going to criticise websites, but I have got some not so good examples as well. Just this 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 sort of cause discussion, I guess. So this one as well, you know, it's the exact same as the last one. It's almost the exact same size of button, and it's in the top right hand side, and it's got the exact same word book. But this is a sort of dark website, and the button's dark, so it doesn't stand out as much on that as it does on the Balmoral when we were looking at it little things like that so maybe make the button a bit bigger or maybe change the color again or maybe brighten up other parts of the website so that that book button stands out a little bit this one here just again is an example and again it's not it's not picking on people but if we actually just go to this one live we'll show you and um, i've got so many tabs open it's going to go wrong at some point and um, so this is the if i go back to the the home page it took me a little while to find the book button on this one um, now that I know where it is, I feel silly because it took me a while to find it, but it took me a while to find it nonetheless, so I could be a potential customer. So this is it here, is the, the sort of banner in the top left, inquire or book, but I'm so used to logos being in the top left-hand side, but the logo's over here. You know, so I'm instantly looking sort of over here for a, for a book button. Um, and they don't, it doesn't look like they actually offer online booking, it's inquiry system, so I'd maybe be pushing inquire, but certainly I'd be making this clearer over here. And as soon as you scroll down, 
there are no book buttons on there. Um, another example, just while I've got this up as well, let me just um, show you, because this is the next slide I was going to show you, but I'm live anyway, so I'll show you anyway. This here, South Sea, South Sky, Sea, Kayak, a mouthful to say, but this is a good example of possibly coming back to do it later, and now you should just fix it. Um, so I'm browsing around their website, and they have a Contact Us page. Um, if I click on the Contact Us page here, Sorry, it might take a wee while to load. I'm trying to do it live just to show you rather than it just being screens. I think that helps so much more. If I come to the contact page on this site and then scroll down, I can see here that it says you know you can now use our new online booking system. So then if I click on that, it, it takes me to a booking page where I can book now. So why is that not in that main menu? Why is that not one of the first things I see in, in that main menu? Um so Think about the calls to action that you're using it and where you're placing them. Think about what they are and what you want them to be. Is it the book? Is it the inquire? Is it to get me to download something? Um, is it to get me to read a specific bit? Is it the pricing page you want to get me to first? Think about what those calls to action should be and think more strategically about the placement of them. Don't just fling them in. Um, top right, through the content, on the header. We know, for example, this one here, the Eat, Eat Walk Edinburgh. Uh, is a good example because it has the button right in the header on the home page. When it loads, come on to internet. So when it loads, it's right at the top, but this is a rotating banner. And if you give it a couple of seconds, it disappears. But what they do quite well is it actually further down the content. They also have calls to action throughout the content. So yeah, so some good stuff to think about. Just just on the the content, people do scroll on your website. You you put quite a lot of content on them, so so people do scroll up and down. So there is research that shows up at the top and over to the top right is a good place to put them. But do remember that people scroll. And um, so if you've got a big long page and you've only got that button at the top, that's a lot of content that I'm looking through that I'm not seeing those calls to action, and I might forget and I might leave. So we'll tell clients to think about maybe spacing these key call to actions, maybe every 25% or 30% down the page, whether it's a, just a single button or, or a couple of buttons and giving them options. So um, this will tell you as a sticky check availability at the bottom of every page, which which works quite well. Um, this is Sterling Jail. It works quite well when you're clicking through some of the pages on it. They have the big book now that sticks sticky at the top, but it also has a book now button throughout the content as well. Um, eat walk tours, calls to action throughout the text as well. This is particularly good as, as an example because it also goes into huge detail about what you get within the tour. So where you're going to go, what places you're going to go, the types of food that you're going to eat when you're there, how many people will be on it next to a book now and an inquire. So I want you to book, but I know that you might have a question and I've given you loads of information, but I'm also going to give you the option to inquire as well, just in case you've got another question. Brilliant, great way to do it. Really good example of it. Okay, are we all okay? Let me just check the time to see how far behind I've ran already. Hopefully not. I think we're still okay, Sean. Time. Um, high quality content. Content works. Imagery works. Imagery works really well. We know from studies and research that imagery is generally interpreted about 60,000 times faster than text. So if you're not using imagery or you're missing a trick, if you're not using good imagery, you're still missing a trick. You could, it could maybe less of a trick, but make your imagery better. Ideally, make it real imagery. You're in an industry where you're blessed with lots of people taking pictures of, of all the scenery and the things that they're doing. See if you can tap into that and use it rather than it being stock imagery. Um, it definitely tells a story. Some of these examples are really good, happy people, um, happy people carrying out activities and teams smiling. You, you can't really fake um, a, a good proper smile, can you? I think when you look at a stock image, you know if it's a real smile or not, don't you? But some of these are, are really, really good, good quality images. Um, and if you click through live to some of the sites, again, we're on this one. So there's imagery down here that's actually been taken when they've been out on the tour. Um, the site near limits. I mean, great videos, things happening. Um, yeah, lo lots of lots of good stuff. Um, Wild Scotland, the same. Some imagery further down of people actually using the using the services. And again, it sounds like I might be picking on this one. I, I wish I'd thought I, I hadn't mentioned it so much. But if you click into this one, just, just as an example, and again, lots of good things about this website. Um, just unfortunately, a few things would probably change. If you click into each activity on here, as an example, loads of outdoor stuff this website has on it. But nearly every service page or activity page has one picture. 
and in a lot of cases they look um, more posed rather than actual, like like this one. Oh, you could get a lot more imagery in there, couldn't you? You could be doing away with all this background imagery and focusing on a handful of images in there just just to make it stand out. So think about the imagery. There are thought libraries out there that you can use, like Pexels and, and Pixabay and whatnot, but but try just looking through all the imagery that you already have and see if you can put that on the website just to put some real authentic feel into what you're doing. People do interpret it faster. They will see it. They'll see the happy faces and they'll stay on the website and scroll versus just lots and lots and lots of text that isn't formatted that it might encourage them to, to leave again. Um, hopefully, hopefully that is helping so far. Um, text content. I mean, just as much of it as you can. But obviously, draw the line at making it look silly and ridiculous and unreadable. It's still got to be formatted well, clear headlines, which we scan these days rather than read word for word. So that doesn't mean cut out lots of text because text is still good for search engines and it's still good for us, the user. We want answers to questions. So it doesn't mean remove the information. It more leans on, do you know what? Format it a little bit better. Make it easier for me to read it bullet points, short paragraphs, subheadlines, FAQ sections, all these sort of things, get them on there. Um, so just some examples of what's included in your stay here. It's, it's only four or five bullet points, but you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a parent. So to go somewhere knowing that there's two, three hours of childcare and they've got, I think this one in particular, I mean, I'm not going to go just to ship my kids off with someone else. I don't know, I might, it depends how they behave. But the rainy day entertainment, yeah, do you know, we live in Scotland. If I'm traveling anywhere to stay in Scotland, there's a good chance it's going to be wet that day. It just is. So to know that there's entertainment specifically for rainy days, brilliant. That's great. That could be a lifesaver for us. Good information to have. And then obviously free Wi-Fi is a massive thing these days. So if you've got it, shout about it. Parking, all that sort of stuff. And um, this is from the Museum of Flight, just as an example of information for your visit. And if you click into their website to have a look at it, it's, it's worth doing. They've got all this information and if you click into it into each of those there's links to go to even more information in there so it's all it's all really good and then back to the, the one we were looking at the, the max adventures i mean there's just so much information in there holiday styles how to book faqs booking conditions the app travel insurance oh, just so much good good quality content in there and um, so think about what it is your users are looking for what are they asking you when they come to stay with you, what are any complaints that they might have? What are they asking for? If you've done anything for search engine optimization, what are they searching for on Google? Are you talking about those sort of things on your website? That's not a technical fix. That's not some big complicated thing you need to do to a website to get it working. That's just understanding your customers' needs and answering them. Text on the website, brilliant. Uh, so just make sure you're doing that. Content flow, so you've got images, you've got calls to action, you've got text on there. Don't just plop it all on. Um, it, it does need to flow a little bit. And again, I said at the start, some of this can be quite common sense. You'll have used websites. You'll know which websites were easy to use and which ones were a little bit harder to use. So, so think of that while you're looking at your own website. Ask people to review your website and give you feedback on it. So this one up here reviews straight away into a big quote about what they do and then straight into search for activity. So a little bit of flow, and then you can go and read some other information afterwards. So the main things they want you to know about are above the fold, the top half or the top part of, of that website. Um, the same, no limits. A little bit confusing, I'll, I'll probably go and admit here, um, if we just go to it and show you it. Um, if you're up the top, it's, it's a nice website and great imagery and whatnot, but there's uh, availability, start now, availability and booking, view our activities, and let's get started. Um, and let's get started doesn't actually do anything although it changes to a mouse pointer, doesn't do anything when I click on it. And when I view our activities, all it does is scroll down to there. Let's get started. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what that was. Something happened, but it took too long. So there's another thing um, just to be aware of. Make sure your links work and that they work properly when people are clicking on them. Um, so just think about the flow through the website. I think the Tontine Hotel is quite a good one for this. I know it's, I know it's accommodation, but it's a it's a good one to think about. It starts with a couple of big images, quite clear headline that they're in the heart of Peebles, so they're literally in the middle of Peebles. Paragraph about who they are straight to offers because we know you're going to want a deal. Why stay with us? Well, here's a number of reasons. We've got parking and we allow pets and we've got free Wi-Fi and we're COVID safe. And here's what some other people say about us. And just so you know, 
We like to think we're quite good. So here's some imagery about what it looks like when you're in our hotel staying. It's just flow. It's just a little bit of thought. And probably they've gone a little bit more advanced where they've done what we would call A-B testing um, to test different versions of this just to make sure make sure it works. Um, the hour's going really fast. I hope this is helping everybody. Um, I'm sure we'll get questions at the end. Hopefully we do and we'll try and answer them. Consistent user experience. Um, this largely is just talking about the branding that you use. So if you're saying something and you've got a tone on the website, you know, stick with it across social media and all your other marketing, specifically for websites though, just look at the mobile experience of the website. So you've gone to all that work to make it look really good on desktop. How does it look on mobile? So we're talking about scrolling up and down a page, for example, calls to action on a page, look good on a desktop, but how do they look? On mobile, do I have to scroll an awful lot further on a page before I'm able to see them? Is the text as easy to read? Have you thought about the spacing between all the sections? Um, so think about that. For for those that don't really know, um, I know we've had questions before about well, how do I test on a mobile? I've only got one device. I don't know how to test in others. So just a big part of mobile testing is just testing that your site's responsive. Responsive means they're all folds in and out um, as people use different screen sizes. Easiest way to do that, um, if we pick, who can we pick? I don't know, CK, I can let, let's do Adam, uh, Sterling Jail. Easiest way to check on mobile, or one of the ways to check on mobile, just minimize your browser on desktop. So you've got this little window, and what you'll find is if you gradually drag it out, that's you seeing responsive design working. So you'll see just at that point there, the menu changes and drops down to being a little sort of three line menu at the top so you can do it on desktop and test for mobile scroll up and down see where your buttons are not a lot of space between that button and the image for example but on the desktop version there is a much more space there's not anything round about it cluttering it so just check your mobile as well don't don't leave it till after go and look at it um other things to consider and um, we'll move on to measuring just in a second but security of your domain name make sure you've got https Site speed is hugely important, particularly in your industry where you've got a lot of visuals and whatnot on there. So run uh, your website through a tool called GT Metrics. That's one of the ones we use. And um, broken link check. You know, search engines and people follow links on your website. If they come to error pages and are not working, it just frustrates people. So check to see where they are. This broken link check. Um, I did do a live one uh, before we started because you know it wouldn't be too much fun if you didn't. So we put in wildernessscotland.com because actually we've used that in a few examples where it's quite good and it, the site's quite good this is a free tool to use you just go and type your domain name in so the, the link's in the slide so go and do this yourself so good website um but we'll put it through here and this is a list of 116 links that are broken on this website that have been found that could all be fixed all of them should be fixed so then one in particular that stood out to us uh, I'm going, not going to be able to find it now, Emma. This one here, financial protection scheme. Oh, what's that? So we click on it. Now we're through on the Wilderness Scotland website. So it says it's a financial. It says the link text is financial protection scheme. So this is us all on a page about all about the company. So then if I search for financial protection scheme. Our assurance and your financial protection, good, loving all that sort of stuff. So there's the link there that apparently doesn't work right. So let's click on it and see what happens. Page not found. So that's a link in a section on that website that's all about driving trust for you. Assurances and financial protection taking it to a page that doesn't work. You know what? Get it fixed. It's not a hard thing to fix. So make sure you go and use. Uh, that tool. Um, don't be worried if you get loads of them. Don't don't get upset if you spot lots of things wrong. It's just things for you to fix, so worth doing. Um, also, your error page as well, just as a quick test. Go to your domain name and put slash name after it. Uh, that, that'll help you. If I go to any one of these websites, if I go to the Balmoral and type Brian, this will let you see what your error page looks like. So people will see it. So you could make it friendly and have navigation on it rather than you don't have to have big glaring error messages on there. You could be quirky and say things on it like, oops, don't know what happened to the content. Let's let's try and sort that. Let us know about it. So, so go check these other things as well, legals, all that sort of stuff. 
that all okay? I, I'm answering you, asking you, and you can't answer me. <laughs> but hopefully, hopefully that's all okay. Uh, SEO, user experience, then we've got a quick poll, and then we'll move on to measure, and then we'll, we'll stop for a QA. So SEO is important. Um, there's two webinars about SEO coming up. We'll put them at the bottom of the slide here. So if you're not booked on to them, get booked on. SEO is really important. It's really good for, for obviously traffic to the website. The reason I'm mentioning it today is actually I've mentioned at the start that they work really well together. If you're doing anything to improve user experience, you will be addressing things like how fast the page loads. You will be looking at security. You will be putting quality content on the website. You will be looking at flow. These are all things that are known to be things that search engines are looking at when they're deciding where to rank your website. So if you're tackling usability, you're going to be positively impacting your potential to rank organically too. And the same vice versa, if you're doing work to try and rank higher in terms of understanding what the customer searches for, how they search for it, how often they search for all the variations, that's going to help your usability because presumably you'll be updating uh, headlines and content on the website to match, so clearer calls to action and proven layout. So they, they go hand in hand. So make make sure you go on that uh, that webinar as well. We have a quick poll to do, um, and then we'll move on to the measure. And I'm conscious of the time already. My my um, my waffling. Sorry. Oh, sorry. What is that? There's something playing in the background. That's not me talking. That's an example that's meant to be loading in a second, talking to you in the background. So let me launch this poll, um, and hope that I do it right. So launch. So you should see a poll on your screen. Um, there you go, people filling it in already. Awesome. So we'll just give it a couple of seconds and then I'll just close it. I think 70%, 71% have answered it now. That's cool. Um, give it five, four, three, two, one, right, and I'll close it now. So 71% of you voted. Um, so let me just share the results to see what happens. So you should be able to see that, I assume. So 36%. Um, said the last time they put themselves in the customer's shoes was in the last three months. 36% said the last six months. 23% said they've never done that. Um, so I guess part of the context of, of that is, is, is just, well, if you have done it in the last three months, what were you looking for? Uh, and hopefully some of the stuff we've shown you there are things you can go look at. Um, just before we move on to the next section, make lists. <laughs> I know not everyone's a fan of lists. But when you start doing this, start going through this, start getting people to ask, uh, start getting people to give you feedback on your website, looking at other people's websites. When you start using analytics, heat mapping, all, all these sort of tools, you're going to have a lot of information. Get it written down. Um, trust a notepad and pen. Um, use a Word document or whatnot if you want. A notepad and pen, I think, works well because it sits on your desk. You can't hide from it. Little things, just write them down. You don't need to know the solution just now. Just get them written down. You might end up with up to 100 things on the list. Good, brilliant. It means the next time when you're sitting wanting the website to perform better or online to perform better, you've got all these things you can start tackling. And I know it might look overwhelming as a list, but if you sit and just think about it all in your head, it just becomes this big unmanageable thing that you won't address. Whereas if it's a list of 100 individual small things, pick one and tick it off, then pick another and tick it off and just keep going and keep going and keep going. It will make a difference. Um, have a look at this link as well when we when you get a copy of the slides. It's quite a good article. It talks about conventions, so simple little things like just you know just put your logo at the top left. There's no design conversation about that. That's where it typically goes. Just put it there. So just through quite a few things like that that you could probably use to start your start your list of tasks. Um, okay, cool. That that seemed to go okay. I think we're still kind of on time, a couple of minutes behind. So let let me let me go through the user experience part. And we'll do the Q and A. So measuring. We, we do a lot of, I'm kind of laughing, I shouldn't laugh, we do a lot of analytics and conversion testing and whatnot for customers. Um, and it's a great topic and it works, but dear me, people are put off by it because they find it intimidating and who wants to look at spreadsheets? But if you're doing anything to try and improve usability, this is an absolute key part of it. You need to be doing it. So just, just make the jump in and go and look at it. There are tools out there that can help you. You'll have heard of some of them. Hotjar, I'm going to show you an example of in a second. It's really good. Google Analytics, there's a webinar about that in a couple of weeks' time. Um, get some of these written down and start looking into them. They, they, they will help you no end. Um, so if we just have a quick one about Google Analytics, there's a webinar about this in a couple of weeks. I'm not spending too much time on it just now. Um, but great, I mean, it lets you know what traffic sources are driving traffic to the website, for example. Uh, it lets you see which pages people get to first and then leave from. Let's you see how long people are 
Staying on a website, you can set up lots of advanced tracking to track the clicks on specific buttons, video plays, downloads, all these sort of, you can really understand what is and is not being used on a website. Just a very quick example for anyone who doesn't use it at all. Um, this is a landing pages report from one of our test sort of websites. And you can see the variance in bounce rate and conversion rate straight away. So this page here with a really low conversion rate and a really high bounce rate, right? We'll see on that list of things that I want to go and address. I want to now write one of them down. Why does that page have such a low conversion rate? That's all I'm writing. And then I'm going to allocate an hour to just go and look at that and see if I can maybe do something about it, come up with some solutions to change it. And um, so we'll chat about that more in a, a couple of weeks of Google Analytics. And um, some other tools out there, heat mapping. If you haven't done heat mapping, I recommend you go do it. And um, this is just a, a couple of examples from a, a sort of promo site about what it looks like. And um, so the, the the scale being the the warmer the colour, the more people clicked or hovered, and the darker the colour, the more transparent the colour, the less people were, were interacting with that part of the website. And um, you can get it for hovers, just where the mouse pointer was, and you can get it for actual actual clicks as well. And um, in reality, it works very well though. Uh, one particular report that we like is called the scroll mapping report. And this is one we actually ran for someone just before lockdown. So this is their page with a heat map on it. Their, their website wasn't red, yellow, green, blue. This is a heat map over their website. So what you're looking at is the sort of top bit of the page. And this down the right hand side is the whole page. So it's quite a long, long page. So we put heat mapping on, want to know how many times people are actually seeing all this content at the bottom because it's it's quite load heavy. It's got a lot of images and whatnot have to load in the background. And um, so what we quickly found is that uh, this part here, it's very faint. I know you probably won't be able to see it, but only 50% of the people got that far down. So all of this stuff down the bottom from the, like the remaining three quarters of the page, less than 50% of the people that got to the page viewed that. So what's the point in all of this content? Maybe that is an argument for, well, maybe we need better calls to action at the top of the page to push people to relevant sections further down. If they're not relevant sections, then they are impacting in page load speed, which we know impacts in organic search. So maybe we could cut some of it out. We did have an argument that said, well, do you know everybody got what they needed right at the top? So that's fine. It's fine that they didn't scroll right. Well, you're impacting page load with the rest of it then. So maybe get maybe get the balance a little bit better. It's a really, really, really good visual, quick way to get an idea of how people are interacting. And we use a tool called Hotjar. They offer a free trial. It's worth signing up to. Um, at the end of the free trial, you can downgrade to a free version of it. And a lot of our clients are just on the free version and it lets you do three heat maps at a time. And all it requires is a little snippet of code on your website to get it to work. So go look up Hotjar um, and, and see if you can get it set up on your website. Other things that are a bit more advanced, um, I, I'll, I'll maybe, or maybe not play this video just now. Well, I might play it in a second. Um, go to the link though. This is usability testing. Um, it's a process where you can submit a question to a website and invite people to answer the question on your website. So in this example, it's Airbnb, just so you know. So it's not just us mere minion small companies that have to do this. The big companies do it as well. Um, so Airbnb put forward a test uh, and the test said, go and find the cheapest accommodation you can in San Francisco. That was it. Uh, that's what's written in this little box here, and the user records himself trying to find it. So navigating around the website and very quickly highlights that, well, you've told me to find the cheapest, but there's no functionality on there for me to order that by price. I can't format or order the accommodation by price on the page. So I can't do what you've asked me to do. So it's such a can't see the wood for the trees type effect from Airbnb's point of view. So yeah, worth doing. Some of those heat mapping analytics, usability, we know they get a bit techy. You could also just ask your customers. So things like Google Forms, free, SurveyMonkey, dead cheap, and um, tools like Hotjar that has some questionnaires in it. You're possibly already asking customers when they come and visit you um, what they thought about the service. So maybe you could ask them questions on that about the website and the experience of booking online and, and how that was. So, so just ask your customers about it. Um, so, yeah, lots of tools out there that you can measure by. I'm not going to bog you down in it because I don't want to put you off doing it. Just be aware they are there and they're not all hard to use. Um, we've got one last poll to use and, and one last slide, and, and that's us. We'll do, do some Q&A. So let's see if I can get two polls running in a row, uh, working in a row. So let me try and load this one. This is just all about just trying to understand if you already use analytics to any degree um, when you're trying to measure user experience or 
I guess, trying to just understand how the website works in general. Oh, that's a more decisive answer. I can see the results coming in already. That's fine. Um, so we're up to 70%. So let me do it again. Five, four, three, two, one, close. Okay, so let me share those. You should see the results coming up on your screen, hopefully. So 76% said no. 24% um, said yes. So for the 24% that said yes, good. Um, good on you. For the for the 76% that said no, you know, don't don't worry too much. You you absolutely should be doing more with it. I would highly recommend you do more with it. But actually, you are the in the majority. Most of the customers we speak to aren't doing it or aren't doing it properly yet. But make the make the start. Start doing it. It'll, you might not go into great detail with all the data right now. But if you come back in five months' time, having collected five months' worth of data, you'll have a lot to look at and a lot that you could then go and optimize. Um, okay, so on to the last slide. Just a little bit of a summary, points to take away with you. Um, user needs information, give them to it, give, give them it. I couldn't think of an easier way to, to say that. They want information, put it on the website. They're going to go Googling anyway. They either get the answer from you or they go somewhere else, and that somewhere else might be competition. Make the journey A to B as smooth as you can. So it's hard to actually work out the real path through the website because people come from so many different channels and land on so many different pages, don't they? So smooth A to B isn't always actually as easy as, as it sounds, but don't make them get to A to B via C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. We try and make it fairly succinct and obvious. Credibility, I can't shout about credibility enough. Even some of the examples that I haven't used today, you go to them, examples where the website's good, but it's missing accreditations, it's missing contact details. These are simple, simple little things that you could be going and doing. Visuals, maybe slightly harder because it maybe takes some tech or some photography skills or, or data collection to have the right imagery there. Real imagery works. Um, so go and look at the imagery that you're using and make sure it's not just imagery you've flung up for having the sake of having something there. That it's actually serving a purpose, that it's doing something. Content, get it written, get it on there. Testing and monitoring. We're, we're going to do a monitoring, a, a measuring webinar, an analytics type webinar in a couple of weeks. So, so come to it. We'll chat a bit more about analytics and some of the things you can get from it. But do do take the step. I know it's intimidating, but take the step and do it. Um, and the last one, I did mention the notepad. Get one. Um, a, a pocket pad, favorite pad in the world, a pocket pad. Get one of them. Uh, and just start writing stuff down and just start ticking them off. Don't worry about having to tick off 100 things. Pick one and tick it off. Then pick another and tick it off. And at least you're addressing it longer term then. Um, last couple of slides uh, and we're done. This slide, you, you can have a read of it once you've downloaded them. It's just got lots of sort of links in it. Um, information about the upcoming webinars. So the next one's on the 28th, managing your reputation. The two SEO ones should be pretty good as well. Analytics and in social media in there as well. So I'll, I'll let you read that one on your own time. And then the very last one um, is just uh, to say a, a thank you. We're, we're going to do a, a Q and A now. So if anyone has any questions, I'm, I'm happy to try answering them if I can. <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, we also have a link here, which is the this link here. Can I can I paste these into the chat to see people having to to type? Yeah, we've done that, that Brian. Oh, so have there's, you? There's, okay, cool. We've posted into chat. So anyone, if you look in the chat on the control panel, that'll have the that link. With the pin, so we'd love we'd love if you could uh, fill that out. So, um, it's fair to say, Brian, that there are no questions at the moment, but sometimes that does happen for because people are listening so intently that they're having other time to to put something in. But now is a chance to, if there is something um, to, that you'd like to ask Brian or ourselves, then then please uh, use that functionality. Uh, what I will say, just giving you a little bit more time uh, to to post that is. We also will give you an opportunity at the end of this webinar, just when we close it, to access a digital review done by Visit Scotland in Industry Relationship Managers. It will what they do is a 10-point check to check your digital footprint and give you some really good practical advice that you can go back and implement in your own business. So the only thing we ask is that you commit to doing the actions that the report that the guys do for you that um, that you actually do something with it that's that's our single ask so that's coming up directly after our, our the q and a when we close things down um let me have a look and see um 
what questions we've got, if any, since coming in. I think there's there's a ah yeah, there's a few coming in. Um, hello, and great session, Brian. So so good to see that feedback. Thank you for that. Um, there we go. So seeing as it's so many people don't check Google Analytics, Brian, how easy is it to add Google Analytics to your website? Um, it's it's not as difficult as people think. Is that a, is that a good answer? I don't know. Um, so we'll we'll do that webinar in a couple of weeks and we'll we'll mention it. Setting up Google Analytics itself and get you ultimately you need a snippet of code on the website. That that's the main way of getting it working. Getting the snippet of code isn't difficult. You you register for analytics, it asks you a few bits of information, company name, web address, and it'll give you the snippet of code. How you actually get the snippet of code on the website comes down to what platform you use, um, how the website's built. So a developer could copy and paste the snippet of code into the website for you. But if you're using things like um, WordPress, for example, or, or Squarespace, often what they'll have is a section in the settings where it'll ask you for your Google Analytics ID, and you would just paste it in there and save it. So it's not it's not overly difficult. People are usually just put off because it's code and it sounds scary, but it's not actually an overly difficult process. Okay, great. And as I said, Brian will cover that off on the analytics session in a couple of weeks' time. Another question is very general. It's it's really a, a top tips type of thing. Um, but someone's about to refresh your website. Um, could I have some tips around sort of you know is long are long pages with links to relevant sections good to do image boxes to click on for main sections so lots of lots of questions I suppose one of the things that we we is worthy of of that sort of comment in terms of scrolling so what's the experience for people who are on desktop versus people who are on mobile is it is it a is it a different way of looking, is there is there a need for your site to be set up slightly differently? Yeah, I think the intent's often different, isn't it? I know mobile's really important. When you look at some of the metrics of mobile, mobile importance grew from sort of 2010, 11, and increased, increased. But actually, for the last year, four years, it's sort of hovered around that sort of 55%, 56% mark of people using mobile over desktop. So it's not not 90%. It might be different depending on industry and and obviously tourism possibly one of those industries. I think one of the things we do kind of know over time is it's the intent of the person on the device. So you've always got a smartphone beside you, haven't you? So if you're on a lunch break or a tea break or whatever, you can have a quick Google on something. But when it actually comes to booking and inquiring and trust, quite often you'll do that on a desktop. So responsive generally means responsive websites generally mean that it will be the same content that's on both websites. But you can program them in such ways that Maybe the call to action is different, or maybe the priority of the mobile website is different to the desktop, and that the mobile is there to drive downloads of menus or downloads of itineraries, these sort of things. Responsive generally means that both sites will look kind of the same. But Patrick, I think it was you had mentioned last week that you know everyone online is kind of guilty of everything's built on a desktop, isn't it? So websites are built on a desktop. If you're writing email marketing campaigns, you tend to do them on the desktop version, but actually knowing how many people view them on mobile, we should be spending as much time on mobile and making sure they, sure they look okay. The, the question about how much content, th there's not really an answer to that. I, th I think we, we know some people will say minimal content because they, they don't want it looking spammy. So we're not suggesting it looks spammy, but you Google stuff. You Google and when you use Google, you might Google three, four times. That's three or four different ways you're searching for something. So if, they've, if the websites you're trying to access don't have that information on them, they won't appear in Google. So the more text, the better. But it's it's trying to get the balance of how it flows through the page. And does it need to be so the heat map an example that I gave that, that page could have been half the length and just had some buttons in it to go to another page to read some key information, you know. So testing heat mapping would let you know if your page is potentially too long. Yeah. I suppose a very one of the simplest things to do is back to analytics, actually look at your current site and see what your percentage of mobile versus desktop is and that that gives you a good start another one just again very simple top advice to encourage direct bookings via website i know what i'd say but what would you say brian <laughs> so in terms of driving traffic to the website or i, I think, uh, I think both. it's about converting yeah so how do you convert 
Um, I, I, it's yeah. probably a fairly simple answer as well. It's, it's having the right information to get me to buy. So I've just booked somewhere. We're going camping with the kids in a, a few weeks, and we're, we're going somewhere else as well. And two of the main things I've looked at, at the aren't price. I mean, price is obviously important, but I want to know if they've got Wi-Fi because they've got two kids that can't breathe without their tech being stuck to their face or, or their hands. Um, and I want to know if there's parking. You know, it's, it's little things like that. And any website that didn't have that information on it, I didn't really spend any more time on it. I think as well, thinking about the post, um, the post click. So I, you might get your website all sorted and the book now button looks nice and clear and whatnot. But what happens when I click the book button? Do I stay on your domain name? Or I know a lot of booking systems in the tourism sector go through to sort of third party booking platforms. That's fine. But a lot of these booking platforms give you the opportunity to brand up your page on their system, so with logos and information. And in our experience, a lot of people don't do that. That comes back to the, I'll get that later type activity. So just clarity of information, what's included, understand what people are looking for, um, and make sure you're giving them that information. Don't hide prices, uh, no hidden costs. Don't suddenly charge me an extra 50% when I get to the checkout. You know, the the Ryanair experience, so don't don't do these sort of things, and and not to hark on about data, but tracking it, because you'll be able to understand what part of that process people are dropping out from in the first place, and then that narrows down what you need to focus on and fix. And I would my my tips would be just make that call to action really clear, and don't make sure that as people scroll that they don't lose sight of it. I think you're absolutely right. Um, I think stop stopping right. short of making it look ridiculous on our page. Have it big yeah. and bright, and make it crystal clear where I know where yeah. to go, and put it multiple times on the page as well. Totally. I think again, someone's asking about analytics, uh, where to start. I, I, you know, I would suggest start with attending the webinar. <laughs> um, that we're going to be doing. It's going to be tourism specific. Uh, it will be so practical, and that will allow you to to to, to get on with things. It's it's. Um, well, the, the plan during it will will show some stuff to do with setup, but I'm actually planning on showing live reports through it as well, just to give you an idea of the sort of information you can gather yeah. from it. I mean, it takes a while to to learn it and really use it, but we'll hopefully give you enough that you think actually I should be using this. Great. Good. I think that's um, all the questions come in. We we'll look forward to seeing you coming on to our further um, webinars in the next couple of weeks. Thank you all. And thank you, Brian. Excellent. Excellent Thank content. you very much. Thank you. Thanks.